Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Bay ICT Tech Talk for April 5th. And uh, today our guest speaker is, um, you know what I'm gonna, I heard you pronounce the name, <laughs> Kristen, Christian Hoyne Gomes. Yes, that's right. Kristen Hoyne Gomez. Close, close yes. enough. <laughs> and she's director of decision science at uh, Certify, which is an American express company. And uh, I have here in a little, little side note uh, about Kristen is that she went to Cal State Hayward. Yes, so that, sure did. Yeah, great, great. And so her topic is a using data science to reduce financial fraud. So, you know, take it away, uh, Kristen. Great, great. Thank you, Olivia. And, and thank you, Lauren. And nice to speak with you all today. Thank you for uh, bypassing the NCAA tournament or maybe keeping an eye on both. <laughs> I will try to be as exciting as basketball. How's that? <laughs> so, um, Olivia invited me to speak today. I work in kind of, it's a little bit of security management, but I would call it more fraud risk management. And I actually started my career in risk management at Wells Fargo Bank. Um, taking a step back, I did my undergraduate in business at the University of Kansas. I grew up in the Midwest. And at that time, there was a labor shortage in the Bay Area because it was the dot-com boom. And so all kinds of uh, professionals were being recruited to startups and they needed more people in banking and other maybe more traditional industries. And so, and I was anxious to leave the Midwest and come to the West Coast. So I interviewed at my undergrad, uh, University of Kansas to come uh, out for a job at Wells Fargo. And I interviewed in two different divisions. One was a technology division and the other was risk management. And risk management was uh, definitely where I was really interested in pursuing and they agreed. So I joined uh, Wells Fargo in their deposit risk management team, which is a team that was assessing the risk of deposit-based transactions. In other words, when you have a savings account or you have a checking account and you're making a withdrawal, um, it's assessing the risk of that transaction. Are you really the person that's trying to withdraw the money? Are you the legitimate owner of the account? As well as do you have the credit risk if you overdraw an account or so forth? So I was um, you know, a young person starting my career in risk management and had some incredible leaders at Wells Fargo. And some of my colleagues at the time, um, you know, what I could see at Wells Fargo is that there was power in being able to read data. And so when we could look at the data in mass and be able to see trends or see opportunities, there was really, you know, you could really get a lot of intelligence out of that. And one of my colleagues at Wells Fargo was doing a master's at night at Cal State Hayward in statistics, and they still offer the nighttime program. And uh, so I decided I wanted to pursue it further. And I did my uh, master's at night while working full-time for Wells Fargo in statistics and it's an excellent program it's designed for professionals so there are people from genentech and you know all kinds of other bay area communities that really just wanted to learn more about statistics so i did my master's there after i completed it i was um, ready to try something a different coast so i applied and was accepted to a job at american express in fraud risk management that which is headquartered in new york city so I moved from San Francisco to New York and worked in the headquarters of American Express for several years. And then I've slowly migrated my way back out to the West Coast because <laughs> that's the site where I decided I really wanted to live. So you all are lucky to have grown up or be here naturally. I had to work my way back. But anyway, in uh, American Express, my responsibility was uh, fraud risk management for international e-commerce merchants. So what that meant is that any of the global airlines or uh, really global companies that had international headquarters, they were, and you know, e-commerce at the time was kind of really taking off. It was trying to assess that when someone paid with an American Express card, were they who they said they were? Or was it a stolen or compromised card that was um, attempting to be used for fraudulent purposes? So I have now, uh, this year I'll complete 20 years in American Express. So I have found American Express an excellent place to work and uh, have, um, you know, continued my career in risk management. And one of the reasons I find risk management so, uh, you know, it's kept me engaged for 20 years 
is that it's constantly changing. As you may all read in the news, um, you know, criminals are trying every way they can to compromise any of our information, whether it's with a credit card or personal information. And it's, um, you know, they're incredibly clever. We like to say they're really well-educated professionals doing exactly what we're doing to the opposite uh, effect, right? They're trying to steal information to make money and we're trying to protect information to serve our customers. So it's been, um, you know, it's been an interesting challenge after challenge as the, you know, the criminals are really clever and they try everything they can. And we have a whole organization of people at American Express as do most banks and most e-commerce companies to, uh, you know, prevent that and protect our consumers so that everyone can make online transactions and feel completely secure about it and know that everyone is looking out for them and that our objective is for them to get the services that they want to get. So how do I use decision sciences and what I do? So when I started out, I was actually doing more strategy and more consulting with uh, global clients. I had an opportunity to travel around the world, which was really an excellent experience. Um, now I'm really more in the side of decision sciences for risk management. So we were, we, I actually jointly lead a team of 25 statisticians and we build um, and deploy machine learning models and community data capabilities to assess the risk of transactions as they come in. So the certified division of American Express that I work for works with, uh, has contracts with probably most of the e-commerce companies that you all may shop at. And uh, we provide a system that enables those e-commerce companies to send data securely to us where we have a system that runs the data through a model, a machine learning model, leverages community data, and has a set of rules so that they can decision e-commerce transactions and have it be completely uh, seamless experience for consumers. And so uh, the models that we have deployed are mostly supervised models. And if you all know what a supervised model is, that means that you actually use an, uh, a set of data that you know the outcome on and you train a model, a statistical model using that data and then apply it to future data. We also use unsupervised machine learning models, which means that you don't actually know the outcome of the, you know, whatever you're trying to predict and you're trying to group data into different categories so that you can perhaps create features for supervised machine learning models. There's many, many other uses for supervised and unsupervised, but those are kind of at a high level how we use them uh, within a certify. So one of the reasons I think why Olivia asked for me to come speak to you all is that maybe some of you may be considering future careers in decision sciences. And there are actually many, many roles within decision sciences. There is statisticians, so people that are kind of more on the math side, there's um, kind of strategy people, so more that are on the consulting side, and there's definitely technology people that are more on the, you know, moving the data and procuring the data and cleansing the data. So there's kind of any, any person that's interested in decision sciences, you can take more of a strategic approach, more of a uh, technology approach, or more of a statistical approach. So there's, there's all of those roles. And I think I don't need to tell you all, you all know better than I do how, you know, much data is available and how much data that we create each day um, through, you may be doing that through Instagram or Facebook or probably many other platforms that I don't personally use, <laughs> but are the latest trend. Um, so, uh, you know, data is around us and its usage, of course, especially in the Bay Area, but across the globe is in, in many different aspects. So whether you like something like risk management that I have found uh, interesting across my career, of course, there's all kinds of other applications such as natural language processing. So when you go to Google or Amazon and you start typing in a word and it kind of fills in the rest for you, um, you know, there's a machine learning model behind that that is trying to guess at what you're actually typing. So, you know, there are so many applications in healthcare, in uh, you know, in nonprofits, in business, in really any industry you can think of, there is a need today for a decision scientist. And in the slides that I had prepared that I'm unable to share with you today, um, you know, it talked about how the 
demand for data sciences is growing. And I can tell you that when I hire myself, we are always in demand of good candidates. <laughs> it is an area that is definitely growing and, and definitely in need. So I think, Olivia, that may be high level what uh, I had prepared. I realized that's you know, only 15 minutes. Maybe we should open it up now and, and take any questions that anyone might have. Well, I have one to start with, and I think um, this is your your talk is very relevant to a particular project that we're we're looking into at the uh, Bay Area region. Um, at our uh, regional advisory uh, last month, uh, the topic of what uh, the the speaker called um, blue collar AI. Yes, and I think that may be referring to the technical roles that you're you're talking about. And his comment was that most of the people in AI and machine learning, uh, yeah, certainly they are data scientists, they have computer science degrees and data analytics, et cetera. But what he was telling us was that those folks need support uh, in the work that they do. And it sounds like those are the technology roles that uh, you talked about. And we're starting to look into how we create and integrate those programs into our two-year programs, our certificates. So could you tell us a little bit how you work with those folk in the technology roles? What are some of the things that they do? Um, what are your thoughts or what they they would need to, to learn in, in schools to, to be able to uh, come in and into those roles? Yeah, thank you, Olivia. That's that's an excellent question. And I was on that committee meeting. So I remember though that that gentleman yes. that spoke yes. about that, he was very, uh, you know, had a very great perspective on it. Um, I would say I agree. I mean, you don't need to have a master's in statistics to be involved in decision sciences. If you have a passion for coding Python or PySpark or working with big data analytics or you know, even the hardware or the software of it. I mean, there are so many, it's a huge team that comes behind being able to produce and present models to clients. Um, everything from, you know, data cleansing and data policy uh, to the technology roles themselves. And I would say if, if you're interested in that type of role, then there are multiple paths you could take. One is that if you know how to program and you like programming, uh, to be able to do things systematically and in kind of distributed manners, then maybe a, you know, a big data type of technology role would be appropriate for you. If you prefer more um, of the math side of it, of course, maybe a statistician way would be for you. Or if you like uh, more the strategy or the consulting side, then, I mean, there's, there are so many roles that don't, don't require a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. To get involved in data sciences, and um, I, you know, I, I totally encourage people to to pursue it. And often employers will pay for advanced degrees as well. Um, Wells Fargo paid for my master's degree, and so, you know, employers when they uh, see that someone is, you know, dedicated and disciplined, then then often they can help sponsor as well. Okay. There's a couple of questions in the chat for you. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I'll take this one first from Raymond. How much machine learning helped in developing these models in lieu of having people develop these models? It's an excellent question. <laughs> when I first started in decision sciences, this was like the kind of maybe early 2000s, uh, we actually were building logistical regression models. A logistical regression model is a a simpler statistical model that can have maybe 20 to 30 characteristics and often is um, maybe is is more built by the statistician than by the algorithm itself. So it's the responsibility of the um, the statistician to check the distribution of all the features that may be introduced to kind of manually go through some of the statistics. There's software to help with it too, but it requires much more hands-on work by a statistician. Um, However, now when we build models, you know, historically it was like 20 or so attributes in each model. And now we're looking at, uh, you know, anywhere from 100 to 300 to 400 or 500 attributes that can be in a single model. So more important than actually building the model itself is preparing the data, thinking through things like, for example, when we build a 
machine learning model in the retail industry, the, the seasonality of retail transactions is of course in the fall, it's you know Black Friday and so it's mostly like uh, November and December are the high seasons, right? Versus if we're building it in the ticketing industry, then it's more around the kind of the playoff seasons for each of the major sports or maybe the concert season as well. So, or, or when we build for the amusement park industry, then it's more like summertime. And um, in airlines, it's summertime and, and the winter time when people go fly for you know holiday vacations. So now uh, where historically the statistician was more in logistic regression was you know studying the features, actually building the model, validating the model. Now the statistician is more involved in creating the features, thinking through how features may interact with each other and the seasonality of the, you know, the, the, the important aspects around the data that you select to use within the model and the validation of it to ensure that it's stable. So, um, you know, the statistician is still a critical part of building machine learning models, but the role of a statistician has changed from traditional based models into machine learning models. Okay, hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> Raymond, you can tell me if you have follow-up questions for that. Um, Bob asked a question. Do you use graph databases like Neo4j? Uh, I do not. That doesn't mean that we might not consider it in the future, but today we are, we are not using that. Okay, other questions? <laughs> Questions? Well, Hi. I can ask out of my ignorance is what is Neo 4J? <laughs> Bob, should we have you tell? Okay. I'm not familiar with it, so I, I can't answer that question, and we would need Bob to answer that. <laughs> okay. Well, there's another one from Unstable Jimmy. Okay, are near field communication cards more secure than chip cards? Um, I would not say that they are more secure than chip cards. I would say that each type of card has its own security parameters and that there are aspects of both types of cards which are more secure than other types of cards. <laughs> So, uh, but good question. The, the technology in credit cards and in credit card numbers and uh, privacy aspects um, regulation is constantly changing. And so um, we in the credit card industry are constantly evolving our products to make them as secure and safe as possible. So. Great. I think that someone is typing a question. I can hear some typing. <laughs> Stephen, is that you? Are you typing? That's me. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. Do you want to ask your question? Sure. <clears throat> That'll be better. You can hear me, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So I was just wondering um, how much you know time do you spend with the cybersecurity team uh, at Wells Fargo? And I know that's a huge uh, team in and of itself. How much time and energy do you spend with them, um, you know, trying to authenticate, come up with good ways to authenticate clients and make sure, you know, that you don't give anybody's money away to someone who uh, is not who they say they are. Um, and then are certain types of statistical analysis of security related data, are those required uh, under any of the regulation compliances, regulation and compliance frameworks? Like do our status statisticians required to do certain things with their data. Absolutely. Um, yeah, under yes. the compliance regs, yeah, really? As a, <clears throat> as a member of a bank, right? Because American yeah. Express, so I, don't, I no longer work for Wells Fargo. Yeah. That was my, actually my first uh, okay. role in the, yeah. in the field. I now work for American Express and we absolutely have regulations that we have to follow as a bank. Mm -hmm. um, also as an organization, right? We're committed to protecting our consumers and mm -hmm. so there are pieces of data that we don't show in the open to any employee. And, um, you know, there are banking regulations both in the United States and around the globe where we operate that we are required to follow. 
and we all take mandatory training on them, you know, annually and are audited on it. So absolutely, we have, you know, strong regulations, both by governments in the United States and around the world yeah. and, and are careful on it. And I'm sorry, I already forgot your first question. Can you restate it? <laughs> uh, well, um, how much time do you spend with the security, Cyber security. team That's in right. general? Yeah. And, and I guess uh, kind of a follow up to that is like, do the regs require specific types of statistical analyses to try to, you know, to make sure what, that they catch certain things? Is that? Yeah, I mean, I don't personally work in the auditing team, so I mm -hmm. um, I can kind of answer that question. Um, if I start first with cybersecurity, yeah. Um, so my team is uh, decision sciences. We have three core responsibilities at a certify, which is the division of American Express. One is that we consult with our clients around uh, implementing machine learning models to ensure that they're as effective as possible and that they understand them. And you know, any questions or you know, client-specific aspects, we, we talk them through. Second, we're responsible for community data. So many of our global clients commit, um, participate in community data capabilities that we offer, where we take client data and we put it into our big data infrastructure, we cleanse it and, you know, do calculations out, uh, which stands for personal identifying information. But we uh, calculate statistics out of it that we then can use within our machine learning models. And then the third responsibility at American Express uh, is research and development. So we're working on capabilities now that we'll introduce into our, our services in the next you know, three to five years. So we have those three main responsibilities. I personally am not part of the cybersecurity team. So we're a division. Mm -hmm. We're actually part of our pro the product organization at a certify. But we do partner very close with the cybersecurity team that um, and we have a cybersecurity team within a certify, and then there's of course a, an even larger team within American Express yeah. that we also partner with. That um, you know is on the lookout for all kinds of threats to the network and to our consumers and um, so forth. However, I do partner. You know, in my consulting, I work with a lot of different e-commerce clients and. Uh, many of them are part of the cybersecurity organization of their own companies. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on how each organization has their internal structure set. Okay, great. Thank you. I think your, your last question was around auditing, I think, related to... Uh, not, no, not so much auditing. You, put, you, you answered things. Yeah. No, I just wanted to know like, how closely the risk team worked with uh, the cybersecurity team. Um, you know, because I'm sure that attacks have profiles uh, rich with characteristics or features, and they could be, they're probably analyzed statistically, I would imagine. Um, to, Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And we have security teams that work with law enforcement as well, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Good questions. Any other questions? Since there's just so few of us today, you can feel free like Steve did to open up your mic and just ask your question. Absolutely, and I think, oh, I'm sorry, please go ahead. I know you're fine, Kristen. Um, so I wanted to ask, so if someone's interested in maybe taking a look at regarding decision sciences or like becoming a statistician, what would be an area that you would recommend like they could get started in to get an idea on, is this the field for them? Yes, um, so it really depends on what kind of uh, avenue of decision sciences that they'd wanna go into. Mm -hmm. So if they're interested in more of the math, they could take an intro to statistics course or, or um, you know, uh, a modeling course even. Um, if they're interested more in technology, I'd encourage them to think about the, the structure of, you know, the hardware that holds massive data. So, or if they like more the software and coding side, you know, Python or PySpark or Pandas or, um, you know, even SAS uh, historically has been used. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of avenues into decision sciences, depending on kind of which aspect you're more interested in, the technology, the consulting, or the business aspect, or the, the math part of it. Okay, and then I actually had one more follow-up. So, you, within your career, you've been in your area for quite a while in your industry. 
So what do you find that you do as a professional in your industry to stay up to date? Do you take classes? Do you um, find yourself reading like stuff online? Does work send you to specific trainings? Definitely. Uh, you know, over my career, the capabilities that we have used have changed drastically. Like I mentioned before, we were using, um, you know, logistic regression. Now we're doing machine learning. American Express has all kinds of internal training that we have, we have access to. Um, it has, you know, a, like 300 statisticians that work in the organization. So they, there's all kinds of um, internal training that, that is, we're available to. I also participate in a industry conference. I used to be a board member of the Merchant Risk Council. And so there's, uh, you know, regular conferences that we go to. There's also an AI conference that comes regularly to San Francisco. And, um, you know, I think they may give actually fairly cheap student um, entry passes. So that would be another, another option if someone's interested. There's also all kinds of podcasts that you can find if you just, uh, you know, go to whatever podcast uh, app you use and search for decision sciences or artificial intelligence. There are, you know, all kinds of things you can learn there. Recently, I was working on a challenge related to some bots. We had uh, some very sophisticated bot attacks um, that we detected. And so I was attempting to learn more about, you know, this specific new attack vector. And um, a, a bot is basically a script to execute transactions. So it's, it's not anything new, but this, this specific uh, attack, which we prevented, but I wanted to learn more about uh, kind of how it was executed. Um, you know, I, I went on and I just Googled and you can find all kinds of information. It's actually amazing what people reveal on the web. Um, and you probably know that better than I do, but um, you know, I think also there's Coursera, there's um, Kaggle competitions that are available. If you just Google Kaggle, you can find all kinds of, you know, kind of contest type entries into uh, the field as well. Um, so, I mean, those are, all, those are all things I would encourage people look into if you're interested more. I see that we've gotten a few more questions from Bob. Uh, what kind of databases do you work with? So um, we have, uh, multiple different technologies that we use. We have Oracle is one aspect of what we do. And we also um, are, have uh, MapR as, um, you know, it's not a database, it's just a big data infrastructure to, to hold our data. So traditionally our data was all in databases and like col col columnar type of, of data. And now of course it's all JSON and kind of uh, unstructured it's, it's structured, but it requires a lot more data manipulation to get to kind of the statistics that we want to uh, use when we're analyzing data. So it, it is definitely required constant growth and skills as really the technologies advanced, we all have to advance as well. And that's actually one of the things I've actually loved about the area is that it requires constant growth and constant learning. Um, okay, another question. Does decision sciences employ heuristics or algorithms? So, um, you know, I think really decision science is a very wide, wide field. Um, I, I guess I'd ask what you mean by heuristics. Can you, can you clarify your question on that? Bob? <laughs> I'll, I'll let him type in while uh, I answer John Peck's question. How many parameters do your models typically have? Do you train the models on in-house compute platforms or do you leverage a training SAS? Yes. So American Express has an internal unit that we call the American Express Big Data Labs because um, you know, machine learning models are deployed in so many ways in the American Express business, not only to authorize transactions, but also to, um, to make credit decisions, to decide if someone should get a, a bigger uh, credit limit on their card, if we should allow them to have a new product that we serve, um, if we should market to them. So there's, I mean, there's so many ways that American Express uses models across our business. And so American Express made the decision to actually hire a uh, big data labs team that actually innovates on machine learning algorithms um, that, and that we're able to use across our organization. So they 
may take open source or innovate new open uh, new algorithms that we can use within our business. So we mostly train the models that we build and, and that we put into production on American Express created algorithms. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, John. Thanks for the question. Um, I guess, Bob, based on your clarification, I would say that we use algorithms. Great. All right, those were some excellent questions. And you know, Olivia, I could also um, maybe encourage other colleagues I have across um, different organizations that may have a different perspective on decision sciences. Maybe uh, I could refer to you so that while I'm giving a perspective on uh, decision sciences from risk management and from you know, the financial industry, I have many colleagues that I've worked with that are kind of more in some of the Silicon Valley technology companies that also use decision sciences, but in different ways for, you know, um, different applications within technologies. Definitely, definitely, certainly. I mean, the whole thing of in intention of these talks is just to expose our students and our, and our faculty that attend uh, to uh, these, these careers. Um, what they look like, how do you get into them, uh, where do you see them going. So yes, always looking for, for speakers. Definitely. Any other questions? Again, you can open up your, unmute yourself and ask questions. Again, because we do have a small group tonight. going once. <laughs> no more questions? You guys must all be wanting to get to the NCAA <laughs> finals game. I know it. I know it. I, my feeling is I could wait. The, the best part of the game is the last couple of minutes anyway. So <laughs> very true. <laughs> uh, there's a question there. Where did you learn Portuguese <laughs> from my LinkedIn profile? Well, that's a great question, actually. I, um, after I finished my master's at Cal State, which, uh, you know, when you work full time and then go to school at night, it's quite an effort. Um, I decided I wanted to take a break before I took my next job. So I took a study abroad business opportunity. Um, it was um, through the University of Florida, actually, uh, study abroad to Brazil. And I did a kind of intensive language as well as um, business course in Brazil. Um, I've always actually been very interested in Latin American business and it was a great opportunity and to study in Brazil. I also happened to marry a Portuguese man. So it was very handy that I learned Portuguese. <laughs> so I learned some from school and I learned some through my relationship. Any other questions? Well, it sounds like folk are looking at your LinkedIn profile. So hopefully they connect. Great, sure, I welcome. I, I'm happy to take any questions from anyone. If you have questions, you know, please, please uh, send them to me. Oh, we have one more. Were you talking about regressions earlier? Yeah, I was talking about logistic regression. So logistic regression was the standard statistical model type used um, you may, if you've heard of linear regression, basically regression, um, linear regression goes to a linear function and logist logistic regression um, is a regression to a log logit function. So it basically takes a zero or one. So that, that was the standard statistical model type definitely used in uh, risk management prior to machine learning models. In, in machine learning models, mostly what's used are decision-based algorithms like um, random forest or gradient boosting machine. So those are kind of decision tree based algorithms is mostly what's used in the industry now. Great. 
Well, it's certainly been a pleasure to speak with you all tonight. Thank you, Olivia and Lauren for this opportunity. Okay. And again, I welcome any questions. Um, feel free to reach out to me through LinkedIn if I can help in any way. And um, I, I wish you all best of luck and thanks for your time. Thank you. And I say, obrigada. <laughs> De nada, meño prazer. <laughs> all right, Bim. thanks everyone. Bim. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. All right. We all use our little bit of Portuguese that we know to say thank you so much, Chris. Yes. <laughs> all right. My pleasure. Nice to right. speak with you all. all Take right. care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>